welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being with us tonight here at our very special Hatch 101, which is a monthly series to host the different regional startups, founders, investors, ultimately the beautiful tech ecosystem that we um, enjoy all of us today. But today, we do have a special guest, um, the man of the hour, Whoa. <laughs> um, our CEO, Yancy Sproul. So please welcome Yancy. <laughs> We're going to do a, a deep dive in the Digital Ocean theme into Yancey's life, think about who he is for the man today and who he was and becoming to get to this moment. So, is this welcome. like an Oprah Winfrey situation? I got the card. Get me to cry. Is Super Soul happen? Sunday. Here we are. <laughs> um, so you grew up in Buffalo. Tell us about that. What's Buffalo, New York all about? What's Buffalo, New York all about? <laughs> um, you know, I started in Chicago. We got blown across the lakes uh, to Buffalo for various things that were happening in the family in the uh, early 70s. And, uh, you know, when we got to Buffalo, it, was, it had peaked um, because of manufacturing going downhill and Buffalo used to be the gateway between the west coast or the east coast and the, the middle of the country with the Erie Canal. And uh, it got disintermediated by the St. Lawrence Seaway at the same time that manufacturing was moving out of the country. And so the whole backdrop for my life is uh, the decline of Buffalo in the 70s when I grew up. And so it was like week after week, you wake up and people are losing mass jobs because this steel plant gets closed. or so that was how I grew up, and um, we moved there. It was bad circumstances why we left Chicago. We didn't have better circumstances in Buffalo. We kind of gutted it out, and uh, I, as soon as I could leave there, I left to go to Georgia Tech. But um, you know, it was a great time for me to learn about um, myself and really get focused on getting out of what was a bad situation in an environment where there weren't a lot of people talking about going to Georgia Tech or anything else. You know, they were doing all sorts of things to get by, to hustle. And, you know, you're in this sort of quandary of do I do that, which everybody else is doing, uh, or do I go a route that nobody knows? So folks that might not know what the hustle is, what, what yeah. is the hustle exactly? There's no snap face here or any instant chat, right? Where it's just us <laughs> girls talking. Snap you know, face and instant chat. Stuff. These are some, some uh, things we're coming stuff. out with. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's what you, you know, that's what you know. You don't know to go study calculus or pre-calc or go pay some big advisor to help you get into Georgia Tech. Right? You know that. And that's here and now. And so going outside of that is a, is a very difficult situation. There's no mentors. The mentors that, uh, that I had who, frankly, were not people who most people in this room would think of as mentors, but they looked at Yancey and said, you know, you're too smart for this. And uh, you have real upside, you don't want to do what we're doing. And uh, it had a profound impact on me, keeping me straight. Yeah, of course. So why Georgia Tech? You, you fled um, just to seek additional opportunity, but curious why after Buffalo and Chicago, what that looked like for you? Well, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you go back to what Buffalo was all about in the 1970s, it was in decline. And for context, I think when we moved there from Chicago, there was probably a million and a half people in the Buffalo area. Now it's about 700,000 today. Um, and, you know, to go to Atlanta in the early 80s couldn't have been opposite. Um, it was fastest growing. It wasn't at the Atlanta of today. It probably had a million and a half people. They have a sign on Peachtree, for those that you know Atlanta. It probably had two million people at the time, and now it's eight or nine or ten. And, um, you know, you had black business people, and the government was, it was just a totally different, and it was growing. You know, and to grow up in a backdrop where everything is declining is sort of the pie's getting smaller, so it's just depressing. And, um, I remember in, in 2006, I called my mom and told her that 
we were out in Colorado, I said, oh, mom, I, I, we bought this house two years ago that it went down in value. And she was like, join the club. You know, we had 25 years of declining house prices in Buffalo starting in 1980. Think about a world where you have a, a whole generation, all they know is depression and decline. In the US, this isn't, you know, that's the Rust Belt. Um, and, uh, you know, you go to a place like Atlanta and it's just completely transforming. All sorts of things are, are happening. And it was just incredible for me. And, you know, I got an opportunity to go to a program the summer before, uh, you know, my junior, the summer year. And, um, you know, I mean, it was just Georgia Tech. And uh, it was Atlanta. And frankly, you know, at the time, it was, what, $6,000 a year, $7,000 a year to go out of state. And I didn't have any money. I didn't know any of the process to do any of this. So I came back from that program, only applied to Georgia Tech, and uh, I got out. Nobody ever says they graduate from Georgia Tech. They say they got out, so <laughs> it's a tough school. So you got out. Um, and I paid for half of it waiting tables at a restaurant in downtown Atlanta. Full time, the entire freshman to senior year? The whole year. thing. Wow. How did you manage that? I know that? a lot of people think, wow, Yancey, you waited tables? That's how I learned to sell. Yeah. So what, what were you good at upselling when you waited tables? Drinks. <laughs> that's, that's how that's, you work the, the money. tip. The food exactly. doesn't matter. You only eat once. You just keep drinking. Exactly. So done with Georgia Tech, yeah. waited tables, put in your, put in all your, you know, you put all your cards on the table there. What's your first job? What's the real world looking like for Yancey now? Uh, my first job was at Corning. Inc. And uh, when I joined Corning, it was in North Carolina, uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina, in, in their uh, fiber business. And in uh, 1989, 88, I worked there for summer. Um, and then I came back full time. You know, if you worked at Corning in 1988, everybody was like, oh, can you get me some plates? Because almost everybody in the United States ate dinner on Corelware. And, um, and I was like, no, I'm in this optical fiber business. And they're like, what is this? What is that? Nobody knew what optical fiber was because we had patents and you know, people started buying AT&T and all the big companies were buying fiber and replacing copper wires for the whole reason any of us are in this room today. As a side note, for another week or two, I sit on the board of a company called Zale Group, which is a telecom infrastructure company that what do they provide? Fiber. Where do they buy it from? Corning. Um, but anyway, so I, my first job was there. And uh, I, why I came back, it, I had a great summer there. Um, it was this leading edge technology, optical fiber, the cutting edge of transforming the planet. And even though you couldn't explain it to anybody unless they were technical like you, uh, it was just a great, and it was a great culture there. And um, you know, so I went back and I had four great years there. And the reality for me was, you know, I said that I went to Georgia Tech because it was, you know, Atlanta. So there was some social stuff that was really forefront in my mind. The other thing I said, well, you know, I'm gonna get this college thing and then what am I gonna do with it? And I looked at, okay, I can go to get a liberal arts degree from this place and they pay $16,000 a year. I was like, where can I get paid? And then you go down, oh, engineering. And it was 32,000 was the starting salary for an electrical engineer in 1989. And I was like, okay, I'm doing that. And I happened to go to a, a technical high school and like there's uh, Brooklyn Tech here in the city. I went to Hutch Tech in Buffalo, downtown Buffalo. And um, so I was good at math and all that. And uh, it wasn't my passion, but my passion was getting out. So, you know, I went to Georgia Tech. In fact, you know, that was my salary first year, by the way and a lot of the folks that recently graduated from college, my four year out of state from Georgia Tech, graduating in 1989 was $32,000. All in, hangovers, parking tickets, <laughs> books, tuition, whatever. Um, but, um, and it, you know, it was a great sort of entree into the business world because it was such a strong culture, very values based, they valued every human being in the company. Uh, in fact, at the time, in the mid-80s uh, or late-80s, they had this big initiative, what they called value and diversity. 
and uh, Jamie Houghton, who was the CEO, realized you know, early on, if you're gonna be a tech company, you're gonna lead for generations, which you know, Corning was started in Brooklyn, they moved it upstate to, to Corning, New York. I mean, it's a 150-year-old company, and you use it every day, because whenever you touch your iPhone, it's glass that Corning made. And uh, you look at your laptop, that's glass that Corning made. And you look at your big 88-inch screen TV, it's glass that Corning made. Your catalytic converter that you drive in your car is glass that Corning made. The beakers that you used in your lab in high school and college and your kids use now is glass that Corning made. So on and on and on and on. Uh, it's just incredible. But the lesson is, you know, how do you create a 150-year-old company? It isn't about the tech of the moment. You know, they also were a resistor company and a light bulb company. And they were a plates company where you know, more than half the American people ate off of Corning glassware every night, and now nobody knows, you know, KKR owns it or somebody. But they've been able to know who they are, and if you really want to create an 150-year-old company, it better be about something other than, you know, the load balancer or, um, or Kubernetes, because those will be the building blocks, but those certainly won't be the only answer over 100 years. And the only continuity is, you know, it's like any great culture. If you talk to somebody at Corning today, it feels like your experience. And that's how you keep the continuity. So um, it was really hard. I couldn't sleep for three weeks um, when I decided to take another job. But if I wanted to be an engineer, you probably, I wouldn't be here. I'd probably be in Wilmington, still at Corning. Uh, so many people worked there 40 years. It's such a, a great company. Um, so I decided to leave, and I went briefly to a, um, a company called Clorox, which everybody knows. And um, it was a less technical job. I got to work much more with marketing and finance on new product uh, introductions. And I remember my first project at Corning, we were growing like a weed with optical fiber. So they're like, if you can make it go faster, better, cheaper, just throw money at you, go get it done. And um, you know, Clorox was you know, all marketing. And so the engineers, we went from being the glory story at, uh, at Corning as an engineer to sort of a barely necessary tolerated evil at a consumer products company like Clorox. And my first project, they were like, I was like, hey, I wanna do this, I was gonna fix this thing. And, and my boss was like, uh, fill out this spreadsheet. I was like, what is a spreadsheet? And he's like, you gotta enter your cash flows. I was like, what the hell is a cash flow? And um, so I did it, and I went, put all this cost, this, and you know, whatever. And um, at the bottom, it said EPS share contribution. And I was like, next day I started applying to business school. Because it finally connected the dots on what, what I did to the bigger picture. And, um, and I left there, you know, 18 months later and went to Dartmouth Tuck School. So from Dartmouth, this is, you've had many pivots kind of in your um, career and your journey yeah. from Buffalo yeah. down to Georgia Tech, starting yeah. in engineering, and then as many of you know, if you read Yancey's bio, went into finance. Yeah. Several years, successful, single guy on Wall Street doing yeah, this thing. Yeah, don't remind me about New that. York. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> and then another pivot this from- This isn't being webcast. Right? <laughs> and uh. another pivot from uh, finance into yeah. tech. So kind of talk us through that and what you were thinking. Clearly you wanted, s the understood what your dollar <laughs> amount yeah. meant at Clorox. So yeah. yeah what attracted me to finance was I had always been very interested in politics and economics. And um, I just couldn't see when I looked at those charts coming out of undergrad where I can make money at it. I didn't know about the Wall Street. I didn't even think Wall Street was a reality for somebody like me even if I could figure that out. So, um, you know, after going to business school and, um, you know, I, you know, I just you know, went to an Ivy League school. A huge percentage of the folks that were at Dartmouth um, or Tuck went to Wall Street. Obviously, you know, nowadays they go to Amazon, which is amazing. But, um, and I just, you know, I worked there for the summer. I, I loved it. You know, 120 hours a week, and it was just macro, it was micro, you learned so much. Um, and to be honest, I, you know, you talk to people I went to Tuck with, and I tell them now, I'm out in Colorado, I'm doing all this different stuff, and they look at me like, we thought you'd never leave New York, and you'd never leave investment, and I, I love investment banking, but um, 
You know, what I found was one, I had that background in manufacturing and um, in engineering, which is kind of real world and is pretty comprehensive. And I did love banking and the learning curve for anyone who's done it is, I can't even explain how steep the learning curve is. You know, you literally work o overnight, four or five days a week, you don't sleep. I mean, you can't even do that anymore how the country's changed, but then you could. Um, and uh, you just learned so much. And what I saw was in four or five years, you know, if you've done 50 M&A deals, you've done 5,000. They're all a little bit different, M&A mergers and acquisitions, but they all, they all have their character, they all have their intrigue. There's always some math, there's always some glitch at the end. Um, but as I started moving up in the, in the career and started selling more and engaging more with CEOs and CFOs and hearing their problems and um, you know, always being interested in strategy and sort of the big picture and the organizational people stuff that they would talk about, it was just more than doing deals. And so um, I, I actually at a, you know, the cigar bar across the street, um, you know, I was talking with a friend that owned a company out in Colorado who was complaining about they needed to change the management and fix it. And I was like, you know, I'm interested in that. And um, one thing led to another, and I went to Digital Globe, which you all know from, and people thought I was crazy. They're like, wow, you're leaving banking, you're about to be partner, and you're going to do what? And uh, well, these satellites, and they take pictures, and, and this was before Google Maps, so nobody knew what the hell. They were like, you have completely lost your mind. You know, you got married, and now you're moving to Colorado, and you're going to these satellites. What the hell, you know, what happened? I don't know what happened. But anyway, so I went out there and we created an incredible company. And, uh, you know, it was ironic, a year after I joined, we, you know, did the Google Maps deal. Katrina had, you know, Hurricane Katrina happened and we got our imagery out and it was a game changer for the industry. And, um, you know, I grew that uh, business from about 50 million in revenue to 700. And we took it public in 2009 and we created an industry and we helped governments and we helped citizens and, um, and we created a great culture. And uh, so I was like, you know, 10 years, let's go do that again and wound up at SendGrid, same size and same dynamics and um, it's a lot of fun. Very culture-based companies, um, values-based companies and that's central to how they make decisions and uh, you know, I learned that you know, ironically, as a 22-year-old engineer at Corning, um, and that's not what I thought. I wanted to work on all this technical stuff, and I learned a lot more. So with that, with values and how that's made an impact in, on you and in your career, what do values mean to you, and what is the significance and impact that made you drive and yeah. succeed? I think they, um, you know, they create a code of conduct, and they, we're all accountable. So there's no, um, you know, we don't take Wednesdays off. Um, I'm as accountable as every other person in the company. It gives us a way to challenge each other. It's a language. And, um, and it's a framework for how to make decisions. How do you bring people into an organization? Um, how do you grow them in an organization? How do you exit them from the organization? How do you sort of use them as a backdrop to make a big strategic decision, like do we partner with this or do we buy this or do we exit this business? Um, it's just foundational to, I think, how you make decisions that's divorced from the sort of the technical, the tactical. And I think it, um, you know, it, it just creates a continuity and an expectation um, that we are all accountable for. And, um, if you don't have that, I don't know what you have. It was interesting, I was doing a panel a month ago with some fr uh, colleagues from SendGrid, and I was a CFO, COO. As Carly knows, I knew all the math in this business inside and out, and uh, there were some questions about the math of our business, and I literally couldn't remember. I was joking, and our, our head of uh, people, Patty, was making fun of me because you know I was such a pain in the ass about the numbers a year earlier. And I could, literally couldn't remember. And that happened when I left Digital Globe. But you remember the values. So 
And I just think that's a lesson. All these tactical knife fights you have and short-term decisions that, you know, they are important because at the end of the day in business, you got to get more wrong than you get right. You don't need to get everything right. Um, but you do need to get more. You, you have to deliver more than you lose. Um, but you always have to be consistent with the values. If you always win there, I think any business goes a long way or has a fighting chance. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Thank you um, for sharing all of your journey, but would also love to talk about and give the audience some advice as well. Um, so at different stages of scale, um, I would love for you to potentially give the audience at, um, from one to 100 employees, what's one thing a company should be prioritizing? Yeah, you know, there's a great um, phrase, Wall Street has lots of great phrases, but one that I always like is they, there's, they never ring a bell at the top of the market. And, you know, from one to 100 employees, they don't ring a bell to say you have product market fit and you're a viable business. So most entrepreneurs are living in this existential, am I gonna make it, am I gonna make it? And so they're acting as if the business won't exist. And I think when the reality is a lot earlier than you think, it exists. Uh, it's going to exist. And the question is, do you, when do you start to pivot your planning, how you engage your people, how you prioritize resources, which you don't do in a startup, right? You just throw everything against the wall and try to get it to stick. But that doesn't sustain. And so, you know, what's the right metric? There's all sorts of people that write. I don't know the answer. It'll change. It's, it was different in enterprise software than it is in cloud, but that's for sure. Cloud, you know, a lot earlier that you have a viable product market fit because they generally take off. They're viral in terms of how you get customers. Um, enterprise is a little different. You count one, two, three, four to get to several million dollars. I think you have to then start to think, what's this going to be like in 18 months? I'm going to live, even if you're not sure, can I start to change my planning and my engagement with the leaders of the company to think, what, what if we survive for 18 months from now? What do we have to do different that's, that's not going to work? Even thinking about that, if you've never done it before, um, I think the key is, you know, in business in general, you got to win more than you lose. How do you do that? You kind of think around the corner, think about what if, what could happen, what may happen. And if you're not that, if you're so in the moment because you, this is so critically important, and then next month, you know, our, our GC at uh, Digital Globe used to tease me. I was like, okay, we got this thing public. We got these contracts, EBITDA margins, free cash flows. It's perfect. I got this team. I'm just going to play golf. They're going to do this. I'm done. We'll do the budget. I'll do the earnings calls. That's it. And there always was a crisis. There was always a new opportunity that it just never calms down. So in the, in the context of it never ends, the chaos, I was, you, know, you kind of then have to say, well, okay, I'm going to live in a world with chaos. Um, what's that going to be like in a year or two? And uh, nobody tells you that. You know, it's not Series B, it's not Series C. It's probably earlier than you think that you have a viable business. And even if you're not sure, you should start thinking, what if I have a viable business? Because you'll do things radically different year one, year two, year three, if you just ask that question. Yeah, that's great. Really sound advice. Um, so from 500 to 1,000 plus, what should folks be prioritizing? So um, that's a very weird uh, phase, having been in it and been in, you know, 200, you know, 200, uh, 500, so 50 million to a couple hundred million. That's still exciting. You got to change a bunch of stuff and process. That's where we are here at Digital Ocean. I wasn't going to say Digital Globe, but Digital Ocean caught myself. Um, that's exciting because you're building for scale. Along that right way, if you have not put values and sort of process and a lot of that stuff in place, it's very hard to be scrambling. Uh, at 500,000, because the reality is at that point, if you're public, the, a lot of the senior leaders are really disengaged from the business. You're relying on the next 30 to 50 people in the company who really run the company. And the, t the top leaders are really strategizing, prioritizing talent, culture. Um, 
and brand and you, your job as a CTO or as a CFO is so radically different than it is at 100 million of revenue or a 100 person company. You're all in the weeds. You have to make every key decision. You haven't set, you haven't hired the team yet because it just doesn't work that way. You know, at that level, and it was probably the, it was interesting when I was at Digital Globe, we were that big. When I left, when I joined, we were 200. When I left, we were only 1,200. You know, I had a great team. Six of the people that I hired in that company uh, are now CFOs somewhere. Two of them are public company CFOs. And um, one a woman. And um, and I think from SendGrid, I, I think we'll have some more CFOs. But uh, when you have people that are that good, it's like, hey, you know, why, why am I here? They're, they know what all this stuff is better than me. And um, that's a really good feeling. You got to get comfortable in that, and you have to build for that. Um, because it won't work with, like in the founding, in the early stages where the founders and the top four or five people can make every decision and tell 40 or 50 people to do it. You, you can maybe sustain that into the couple hundred. It generally falls down. Um, you do need process, you need talent, you need to change the decision making framework. You gotta align people on fewer things. Um, but if you got product market fit, you know maybe you can get by into the 500 person range without doing any of that. BO's in some ways has gotten to that. But there's no chance the business will fall over. You just have to change the whole decision making model. Everybody's got to understand what's important. Um, there's 50 people who are driving the company and they're not the top people. Top people are steering the ship and then they cascade down and those people have to drive execution. They have to break ties. They have to manage gray into black and white. And if that doesn't happen, you're not getting, you're selling to private equity or Aaron over there who's gonna go sell the company for you and go get it fixed up. <laughs> just, just the weight of an organization just can't happen. Yeah, that's um, great advice. I hope that everyone will take that with them and growing your companies. Um, we have one last question, um, a fun one to end before we open up to the audience Q&A. Um, but we do this thing here at DigitalOcean called One Thing, and uh, I'm gonna answer it. Really, ask I've been you. trying to get us to do that. Now we got it. We got it. Here, this, is, okay, here. this is exactly why this is happening. So <laughs> the one thing that you wish you could do over. That's a tough question. I think uh, leaving Buffalo, you know, I had a single mom and uh, emerging teenage daughter was tough on them. I mean, obviously it transformed my life. Thank you. Um, now we're gonna open it up for audience participation and questions. We have a couple runners, Daniel and Kevin, in the audience. Um, anyone want to ask a question? This gentleman right here. Um, thank you for coming. Um, you mentioned a lot of time in this fire chat about culture, about mm. great company. You mm. kind of mentioned that throughout this conversation and yeah. it looks like that foundation really enlisted in you to become who you are. It kind of groomed you along the way. Um, as someone who's building a startup, um, I truly believe in the same you know, principle of like believing in employee and creating this culture where people could thrive and those individuals being rock stars in their role. Um, what were some one or two things that you took away for that culture in a company to like for you to plant that seed for when you go from employee five to employee 10 to employee 15 and kind of carry that forward. Um, if you could potentially share some of that, that'd be amazing. Yeah, I think if you look at, um, you know, value statements from companies that, um, and by the way, you know, after 20 or 30 years or 10 years of any company, you almost could do a, a sampling of employees, just random sampling of, and have them describe the company and they'll get the values. But, um, and I don't know that you need to be spending time codifying that now, but I think if you look at the themes around, um, you know, transparency, trust, integrity, um, respect, um, customer orientation and uh, accountability, Everyone's got their own words and they have to put it in their own language, but those are sort of the foundational elements that I think if you think about customer, you know, building a community and, a, and an ecosystem and a, and a you know, employee 
to engage with each other on a trust base. You know, we're all here for the same goal, to deliver for our customers, you know, have a career-defining experience, you know, as employees, and, you know, why accountability is in there. We, you know, you have to win more than you lose. Why? Because people invest in you. And uh, you take other people's money or, you know, whether it's your family or your own money or obviously institutional money, their expectation is that it's going to come back and, you know, uh, uh, a VC that is very funny, maybe read him, Brad Feld, he's got a lot of funny quips, but he, he says, you know, the goal of my business is I give you a little pile of money and you give me a huge pile of money back because he's got to go give that money back to his pension funds. You know, early stage tech companies are, you know, you're building a bridge in Thailand or building infrastructure in Singapore or paying a teacher salary for the city of New York. That's who venture capital expects huge returns um, and that's why they invest. And so that's why you got to get more right than not. Um, but I think if you sort of think about the trust, communication, transparency, customer and investor at, through accountability, I think those are the seeds However people word it, we have our wording. Uh, hopefully most people have their own wording. But that is, if you can get that right and engage with people at that level, that gives you a fighting chance. Um, in most depressed communities, most people lose hope. Yeah. So where did you find the courage to not become a product of your environment and to like, think differently than everyone else around you. It's really hard to think differently in most of these communities. So where'd you find the courage to do so? Well, <laughs> I didn't like being poor. <laughs> and so I think selfishly, I just didn't like it. Um, it's just hard. And I, I think that, you know, a lot of people invested in me early who, you know, maybe, you know, they were in the wrong, and I just, I believed. And maybe I watched TV, looked at the billboards, whatever it was, and say, shit, if that, somebody else is doing that, why can't I do that? I certainly don't like this. And, you know, I think the hustle situation is, and it's always fun for me to go back now because, um, you know, I know that I made the right choices, but those folks, you know, they invested in me. Um, and I'm just an optimist. I'm born on the 4th of July. <laughs> I know it's tough right now in this country, but this is a country about optimism. It's about you can do it. And I know, you know, for us in 1970s, to, to some, you could do anything. You know, it was hard to believe, but I was optimistic. And I believe it, I believe it then, and I, it's, there's infinite opportunity in this country. Infinite. All right, next question. Hi. Um, my question has to do with culture. Um, you mentioned that in your previous engagements, uh, most of the entities made decisions based on based on their culture and their, their way of doing things. Um, so it's a two-part question. Um, can culture really be future proof? And how do you initially map out a culture? We always talk about following a culture, but how do we actually define and jot down? You, you get what I'm saying? In the, in the initial analysis, how do we, yeah. how do we establish a, 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 a culture in an, in an institution? You know, there's, um, I, I, I don't, <coughs> I'm from Buffalo. So I'm a blue collar town, so I don't get all into how to describe all this stuff because it's hard. I know that, how do you endure? Like, why did some banks um, endure 2008? I worked at Lehman Brothers. It was a great, I thought it was a great culture. Um, why did they not survive? That was a hundred plus year old company and JP Morgan rode right through it. I think when you talk to, um, by the way, my wife was at Lehman, I remember leaving the office, or she was working from home, commuting back here, and I'll never forget hearing that conference call where they're scrambling for the bankruptcy. And it was stunning for people who knew Lehman Brothers, it was a tight-knit culture, very collaborative. Well, it turns out at the end, it wasn't collaborative. It turned out four people knew what the hell was going on, it was not good, and the rest of the organization 
and you know how it was a great culture below was if you go to Barclays Investment Bank today in the US, it's almost all those same Lehman people that I worked with 25 years ago, they're still there. Um, and, um, but why, for me, that's sort of the test. If it gets really bad, you know, we made a huge acquisition, bought the number two competitor in, um, uh, in our industry at Digital Globe. And um, why did we buy them and they didn't buy us? And I, to this day, think it's values. And you can go read about that. There was a lot of drama. You know, in all the deals that you can do, that was probably the most interesting because other than no murders in that, there was all sex, intrigue, drama, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever you want. Um, and it wasn't being done by us. But I, 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 I remember the day before we were announcing that deal and I looked, you know, at our banner at uh, Digital Globe and we all signed the values, and that's why we won. So I can't describe what is culture. I think it's very hard, and I, I don't really invest in it, but you know, as the Supreme Court decision in the early 70s about pornography, the lead uh, justice said, um, I can't describe it, but I know it when I see it, and I, I think that that's how I look at it. Great. Another question in the back there. Charlie, you don't like that. Hey. We don't have a head of people now, so I can say what I want. Uh, what market signals do you look for in your competitor activity to kind of stay ahead? Um, I think the space is somewhat crowded, but yeah. obviously DigitalOcean is leading, you know, innovation as well as business Yay. on that end. So um, outside of maybe the internal aspects, are there some external factors that you yeah. look for to stay ahead? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. And um, you know, we're one of these emerging businesses that's new, new ground where you know, millions of people come to do.com and tens of thousands sign up every month. We don't sell to them, we produce content. And so digital demand gen is our sales force. So do we don't get a lot of the signals of win-loss in the field. Um, we're really a math-oriented business. Uh, and the signals we get is how long do the customers stay? Why don't they buy more? What, why did they slow down? Why did they leave? Um, but Because we don't have, you know, in the old world in sales, you're so, so, you know, flying with a briefcase next to your competitor and you know who won or lost and why and you spend time in the organization. We don't have that. so you. You have to get very good at analytics, and you have to get very good at creating cross-functional process. Because in a traditional sales model, you actually, by your very nature, you get a sales engineer with sales, with the product people, they actually have to go win the business. And uh, they have to engineer a solution for you. In our world, we got a standard product, you can put a credit card down and you can grow and scale, it's very easy. That's the beauty of it. The, the curse is we don't talk to customers. We have to be proactive about that, but we have to, our relationship and knowledge about our customers is very uh, math oriented. And, um, and it's very collaborative. And, um, and that's how you do it. And you, you, you figure out what are the right measures and metrics and you be religious about talking about that, you know, whatever the right cadence is that you're all, and don't, it can't be thousands of metrics. Um, and that's another problem with a business. You know, we have 500,000 customers all over the world using our data and they're serving, who knows how many, that'd be a good stat for us to know, how many of the people that are building their business on DO, like how, what's their reach? It's huge. And that creates a lot of data. And one of the things you have to be very careful is data isn't the answer. Uh, as I used to say uh, to my team in the finance side, I said, um, numbers don't tell stories. What tells stories? Stories tell stories. And how do you create stories out of data? You have to manipulate massage and know what you to expect or have a thesis. And so that's what metrics are for. And, um, and it's really, really important to manage with you know, some filter down set of metrics 
they can't always be right. They don't have to always be right or you're not always above the line, but at least gives you a, a currency and a dialogue to have a conversation with your people about um, execution. And it's really, it can be very challenging in a business like ours where, you know, 10,000 people come up every month and, and sign up to our business. And uh, we were like, where'd they come from? I remember in the IT, and SendGrid was a similar uh, business, not on the same scale, but I remember we were doing the IPO, uh, the drafting session for the, uh, the S1, and you know, you got all these bankers and all this stuff. And they, the bankers all want a position, um, and they wanted all these logos. And um, we're sitting there with the CEO, and, and our bankers come up with all these logos. They're like Hertz, rent a car. It's like, really? We got Hertz, we got GM. And, um, and one near and dear to my heart, we had the US Golf Association. I was like, how, do, how could we not know that we had 80,000 customers? Here it's 500,000. And uh, we're serving the world. We're the touch point for the internet. And so for thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers, hopefully millions someday, and um, the only way to understand their behavior and characterize it and serve them better is to be very analytical. The story tells the story. Thank you for your story this evening. Um, we're gonna wrap up. Yancey will be around for just a few minutes if you have any one-on-one -on -one questions for him, but please enjoy and give a big round of applause to Yancey Sproul, please. Thank you. Thank you. But we're gonna stick around, have more drinks, have more food, please network and talk to each other. If you have any questions about our startup program, Hatch, please see Martina, Kevin, and any of the Digital Ocean representatives. Thank you so much.